Thank you very much, Nicholas, for this nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends of Liberty, welcome everyone. I'm very glad that you're all here and at this very special event of the Liberal Institute and Students for Liberty, Studierende für die Freiheit. It's not only special because we have today a very famous and interesting guest speaker, but also because the today's language, the spoken language, will be English. So I hope this comes as no surprise for no one because it was written in the invitation, but usually our events are in German here, in the Swiss-German side of Switzerland. Today we will discuss a very heated and inconvenient topic. We will discuss about war. For a long time many people here in Europe thought, well, war is something that is only happening very far away, right? So, but let the events of last year taught us otherwise. War is a very strange phenomenon. Almost no one wants it, but it happens anyways. Wars are occurring, but why? Today we want to ask ourselves the questions, what are the causes of such a terrible thing as war? And if there are specific environments in which war can, wars can like, occur more realistically, like in socialism or in capitalism. Socialists are blaming capitalism for being the main reason for war, which should come as no surprise because socialists are blaming capitalism for basically every single problem they identify, right? So, but a Marxist thesis, which, is, which became quite popular also among non-Marxists, says that wars are primary fought because capitalists and entrepreneurs demand it. And the reason they're doing it is because they want to get access, violently access to new markets, to get violently access to new natural resources they want to put their hands on. And of course, one can argue, well, that the arms industry has no interest in peace. That there's certainly some truth in this argument. But, of course, we have to be very careful because capitalists and capitalism is not the same at all. We have to think about that. Capitalism is a natural order of free markets and protected property rights, while capitalists are entrepreneurs who want to make profits, and they, they very, very well do, and had in the past different interests than in a capitalistic system would have. So they demand, for example, to lock out their opponents from free markets. They want to block them from free accessing the markets and so on. So they have, or, or they, for example, force the consumers to buy their products, which is not a capitalistic element, but capitalists demand these kind of things sometimes. So we shouldn't mix up capitalism and capitalists. When we look at history, we have to notice that wars were occurring much more in the area where capitalism was not around at all. Let's say before the 19th century. Erich Wede, a German sociologist, who deals intensively with this topic, concluded that the danger of war between two states are massively lower if the states are organized democratically as well as if they're economically dependent on each other. In other words, <laughs> if they're trading, which is of course a capitalistic element. Socialism, on the other hand, is characterized by aggressive redistribution of property titles and brutal force. Historically, more capitalistic-oriented states were also democracies. And more socialistic-oriented states were non-democracies. And this makes sense. Socialism is, socialism is not about peacefully and voluntarily trading with each other while everyone's property is secured. No. Socialism is about concentrating power in the hands of a small political elite who can command what everyone else within this state should do and how they should live their lives. War is insofar only a logical continuation of the socialistic principles. The aggression of the state is just not limited anymore to within the state borders, but it's also going outside and spreads over to other territories which they're trying to control or influence. So we could say that socialism historically was not good for peace, and it probably never will be. But what is it that makes capitalistic countries more peaceful than socialistic ones. What is more important for peace? Is it the democratic element or is it the property protection element and other capitalistic elements? And how can we make the world a more peaceful place? 
Let's find out. I'm sure today's guest speaker, Jaren Brook, has a lot to say about this topic. And we are so glad that you're here. And he came from the United States. He's now on a tour in Europe. And uh, we're very glad that he is today speaking to us. Let me quickly introduce him, even though many of you, or almost every one of you, already know him very well. Jaren Brook is an Israeli-American entrepreneur, writer, and activist. He's an objectivist and the current chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute in the United States, where he was executive director from 2000 to 2017. He's also the co-founder of BHZ Capital Management LP, and Jaren Brook was born and raised in Israel, and his parents actually, which came from South Africa, were socialist, which is quite interesting background story. <laughs> So when he was 16, a friend of him lent him a copy of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, leading him to abandon the socialistic thoughts to him, uh, the socialism taught to him by his parents, and to embrace objectivism, which is the philosophy of Ayn Rand. He published many books, is a beloved speaker at several events, and also runs his own podcast and video cast, which is called the uh, Yaron Brook Show. I'm very glad to have you here. Jaren Brook, thank you very much for coming. The stage you. is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's getting, it's getting hot in here. It's going to get hotter. Do I need the microphone? No. All right. I got a big voice. So if anybody thinks I need it, let me know and I'll, I'll turn it back on. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Zurich. This, I think, is my third, I think it's my third, maybe my fourth event with the Liberal Institute. So thank you for inviting me back. It's always, uh, it's always a, a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Uh, just quickly for the students in the room, right, two quick announcements before we get to the topic. Uh, I have some flyers out there. Uh, one is, if you're a student, I thought they were out there. Maybe they're under all those coat. Oh, yeah, they're there. No, not those. I put them here. There they are. They're being hidden by their coat. There's another one. Could you get it out? Anyway, uh, if you're a student, you can get a free Ayn Rand copy, uh, a free Ayn Rand book if you scan the barcode. And uh, you can download a free book, any one of her books. So there's all, there'll be a whole menu of books, and, and uh, you can download. Uh, second, quickly, there's, we have a conference going on in Greece in the first weekend, I think it's the first weekend of April, uh, in Athens. Uh, again, for students, we have full scholarships, including travel expenses, hotel expenses, everything paid for. Um, it's very competitive. We've got a ton of applications. But if you're interested, uh, please apply. And the flyer for that is also over there. Or I think it was over there. Yes, we found it. Um, so pick up a flyer, scan the barcode. You know what to do. Uh, you know what to do from there. All right, so one of the things, uh, as we've just heard, we, you know, we, Europeans, I think, uh, not so much Israelis, but Europeans, uh, war is a distant memory. War is something uh, Europeans have not had to think about, deal with in a very long time. You've had some, in a sense, skirmishes. Uh, the breakup of the Balkans is, is, uh, is one major example in the 1990s where, uh, you know, different tribes uh, were fighting each other. They still want to fight each other. So far, so far, it's kind of peaceful. But uh, that was the extent of war from the perspective of the Europeans. You saw it in the Middle East. And to some extent, you had to deal with it with the migration crisis uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, but it wasn't, it didn't involve actual European forces. And indeed, I think this idea of unity through trade uh, seemed to very much apply in Europe. The European Union, of course, created a system where you could, uh, where there's a free movement of, of labor, capital, and, uh, and, uh, and goods, and resulted, has resulted in 80 years of peace, in spite of the fact, and I don't want to offend anybody, but in spite of the fact that Germany is right over there, right? We still have peace. So it seemed like this trade worked. Uh, and indeed, a lot of the logic behind the idea of increasing trade with Russia was to further integrate Russia into the system, 
into the European system and the idea that if we just traded with Russia, then Russia would be peaceful because at the end of the day, it's all about material well-being, at least that's what, that's what the leftists and the Marxists believe, that that's what drives history, right? Material well-being, what drives history is economics. And if we can connect the economy of Russia to the economies of the rest of the world, we have nothing to worry about. Indeed, if that were the case, then we have nothing to worry about China because China is super integrated into the world economy. We depend on China. Most of the goods you buy, I'm sure, in Switzerland are made in China. And indeed, China cannot survive without, American, without European and American expertise, capital, investment, and, uh, and many sophisticated goods, as they're discovering now with the ban on chip technologies going to China. They're suddenly discovering that they can't survive without good relationships with the West. If that was the only factor, if trade was the factor that determined peace or war, we thought there would be no war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia, and there will never be war between, Taiwan, between China and Taiwan. But indeed, I don't think that the world is determined by economic forces. I don't think the world is determined by trade relationships. I don't think that that is the, ultimately the determining factor. And we'll talk about it. it. Trade certainly helps, but there's something much more important than trade. And I don't think it's democracy. Because, I mean, Germany was democratic before Hitler was elected. Russia arguably had a period of democracy before Putin has established his authoritarian rule. Democracies often turn bad. Maybe they don't go to war as democracies, but democracy is not necessarily a stable form of government. Democracies change. The will of the people changes. So I think if we're going to look for cause for war, it has to be maybe something deeper. Now, capitalism was mentioned. Now, I don't think capitalism is either trade or democracy. I think capitalism is something more substantial and we'll something more fundamental and substantial, and we'll talk about that. I do think capitalism prevents wars. But what is capitalism? What generates capitalism? What is the cause of capitalism? Maybe if we understood the cause of capitalism, we can understand the cause of war. I think at the end of the day, what drives history, and therefore what drives the kind of political system we have, the kind of economic system we have, and whether we have wars or not, what drives all these events are ideas. Fundamental, basic ideas, things that people believe. And where we really need to explore are what are the ideas of peace and what are the ideas of war. Ideas lead to these outcomes. And I think particularly right now, because I think this could be a real turning point in European and potentially global history, it is super important for us to understand what ideas caused the war in Ukraine? Are those ideas more generalizable? Is the war in Ukraine just the beginning of something bigger? Is something shifting? Is something changing? And the peace, the period of peace that we have had, what are the ideas that brought it about? And is there a way for us to bolster the good ideas, the ideas that drive peace, and a way to condemn and minimize the ideas that bring us war? So I think to look at the ideas that bring peace and war, it's important to look at history and to think about eras of war and eras of relative peace. We've never had complete peace. There's never been no violence. But there have been periods, particularly in Europe, where there's been less violence and periods where there's been more violence. And it's interesting to look and dig a little deeper into what led to the violence in particular eras and what led to the elimination to the peace of others. And I think what, if you, you know, looking at history, what really jumps out at one, and I don't know if, you've, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, with the books of Steven Pinker, 
Uh, in particular, he's got a book called Better Angels of Our Nature, which is a study of violence throughout history. I highly recommend it. It's, I think, an amazing book. You know, the things you're going to disagree with, I disagreed with, but it's still, just the, just the data that he presents is incredibly valuable. But one of the things you will note is that Europe has always been an extraordinarily violent place. If you go back a thousand years, you go back 500 years, uh, you know, violence was the way of life. City-states were fighting each other, little countries were fighting each other, big empires were fighting each other, but war was a constant phenomenon. Whether it's a hundred-year war, imagine a hundred-year war, right? A war that lasts a hundred years suggests something about the consistency of violence. That means people were killing each other all the time. Or a 30-year war, maybe, maybe the most violent war, in West, at least in the West, in history, in terms of the number of people killed per capita, given the proportion, the proportion of the people killed in the population, maybe the 30-year war, Catholics and Protestants slaughtering each other in Europe was maybe the most violent, probably more violent than World War I or World War II. And then it kind of really slowed down. Wars became rare phenomena. And when did this happen? When did, when did wars kind of really slow down, particularly big wars, particularly wars between big powerful empires and, and countries? In Europe, when did that slow down and almost go away? Curious. After Napoleon? Yeah, after Napoleonic Wars. So Napoleonic Wars. 1812, 1814, I, I'm not good with exact dates, but somewhere around there. After Napoleonic Wars, Europe goes through a period until World War I where there are very few wars in Europe. What category, what, what, what is um, characteristic of that period in Europe as compared to the period before that? The period going back maybe 500 years. What, what changed? In 1812, 1814, other than Napoleon losing, what changed in Europe between the 19th century and centuries before that? Well, suddenly we had a massive increase in economic production. We had industrialization. But one could ask the question, what caused industrialization at that point in time? It's not clear. I don't think industrialization maybe brought peace. Maybe what brought peace is the same thing that brought industrialization. Something magical happened in Europe and in the West around the turn of the century, around 1800. Something amazing. Economically, the West took off, just took off. Industrialization and everything else, but also peace came. And what characterized that period? What were, the, what were the ideas that drove it? Enlightenment, just separation. Yeah, the, this is the era that comes after which era? The Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. And the Age of Reason is characterized by two things, I think, two important ideas. First, it's a fact that as human beings, a means of knowledge is not revelation. We don't discover the truth through revelation. We discover truth through reason and science. Thinking is what is necessary. Now this is important because I'm going to argue that most wars are caused by a different view of how we discover truth. That most wars are motivated by a mystical, otherworldly motivation. And suddenly that is an element in the war right now. Right. Reason rejects that, rejects mysticism, rejects the whole idea of revealed truth and says each one of us, each human beings, each individual human being can think for himself. 
Each individual human being has the capacity for the reason, and therefore each individual human being has the capacity to discover truth for himself. He doesn't need the philosopher kings. He doesn't need the pope. He doesn't need some superior leader to tell us what the truth is. And what the truth is means he, we don't need a superior leader to tell us how to live our lives. Who, told, uh, who determined what profession you would be in before the Enlightenment? The place I was born? My social class? place you were born? Social class? Not really. It's what your father did. You belonged to the guild your father belonged to. You did what your father did, even if you hated it. Even if you didn't want it, even if you didn't have talent, you were funneled into that profession. What did women? Women didn't get any choices. There were no careers, there were no professions involved. Did you choose who to marry? Not really. Did you choose who governed you? Not really. But think about it. If you believe the truth is revealed, if you believe that people do not have the capacity to take care of themselves because they cannot discover the truth for themselves, then we need guidance. We need philosopher kings to tell us how to live. We need authorities. So one thing that liberated the individual, liberated all of us, is the idea that we have the capacity to think for ourselves and choose for ourselves. And indeed, the difference between the 18th century and the 19th century in terms of individual choice, in terms of what you could do as an individual, what you're allowed to do as an individual, is dramatic. 18th century and everything before that, you could call a permission society. You had to ask for permission for everything. The 19th century is a permissionless society. Suddenly, it's up to you. You get to make a decision. We were free, relatively speaking. It was a revolution towards freedom. So first idea is reason. Big deal. Rejection of mysticism as a standard of knowledge. The second idea is who reasons, who makes choices. The individual does. So the unit that matters in society is not the tribe. It's not the group. It's not the state. It's not any of those things, not the king, it's not the, it's the individual. The individual's life is his own. I mean, this is, the, this is the key political idea that comes out of the Enlightenment, is the idea that the individual's role, moral purpose, is the pursuit of his own happiness, and that he has rights, a right to live his life based on what? Based on his own judgment, in pursuit of his own values. Not the values of the king, not the values of the government, not the values of the state, however you want to define it, not the values of his parents, not the values of anybody else, of the church, his own values. Sometimes they'll be good, sometimes they'll be bad, but that's his problem, not ours. We leave individuals free, we leave them alone. And again, it's connected to the idea of reason. We leave him free and alone because we know he can reason for himself and discover these things for himself. He doesn't need guidance, he doesn't need have some, somebody hold his hand. Each one of us is capable of living our lives. That is a powerful idea. Again, coming out of a period of tribalism, of what mattered is not the individual, what matters is the tribe. And when the tribe matters, when the tribe is everything, when your purpose in life is the well-being of the tribe, a war is more likely or less likely. If we don't care about the individual, are we likely to go to war? Yes. yes. Look at Bakhmut right now, where Putin is sending thousands of soldiers in wave after wave after wave to be slaughtered and to slaughter Ukrainians. Does Putin respect individual life? Forget the Ukrainians. Does he respect individual life of Russians? You can see that even in the way they design their tanks, the way the Russians design their tanks. In, in, uh, if you look at American tanks and German tanks and Israeli tanks and British tanks, you'll notice that the tanks have a, a, a huge amount of investment of money, effort, thinking, 
processes has gone into securing the lives of the people inside the tank. They have this double armor. They have explosive armor. You know, they have all kinds of technology to do what? Not to kill the enemy, but to preserve your own troops. As somebody who was in the tank corps a long, long time ago uh, in the Israeli military, I can tell you it feels good to know that whoever's running your military at least cares about you enough to invest a little bit in, the, in protecting that tank because otherwise it's very easy for you to burn alive. That comes from caring about individuals. That comes from caring about human life. Russian tanks don't have it. Or if they do, it's plastered together quickly and is not effective. And you can see that again in Ukraine with the, with the torrent of the tanks flying out into the sky as they're being hit. That doesn't happen to American tanks. Doesn't happen to British tanks. Doesn't happen to Israeli tanks. Because the Russians don't care about human life. They don't care about individual human life. They don't care about the individual. So, if you ask me what causes war, I would say it's a negation of reason in favor of some mysticism, mystical cause, and it's the negation of the individual in favor of some collective. Call that collective whatever you want, but in a favor of something else, something what do they say? Greater than you. Anytime somebody tells you, you should go sacrifice yourself for a cause greater than yourself, run for the hills. <laughs> they don't care about you. They care about that cause greater than you. You're just sacrificial fodder. And that cause greater than you is almost always, again, the state, the tribe, the collective of one form or another. So, I believe those are the two causes of war. Lack of respect for individualism, i.e. collectivism. Lack of respect for reason, i.e. mysticism. And I'd add one more because I know many of you are big, uh, uh, you know, economics is very important to you and economic principles are very important to you. What is war? You know, we know what, what is trade? Let's do the positive first. What's trade? What, what's the relationship between two traders? You know, I, I gain, you lose, right? Mutual yeah, mutual benefit. Trade is win-win. Trade is a win-win relationship. And this is a, maybe the fundamental principle in economics. That when we trade, at least the intention is for both of us to, to, to gain. Sometimes we make mistakes and we end up losing. But hopefully, for smart, most of our trades are win-win relationships. What is war? <laughs> I'm in Europe, right? Uh, <laughs> what is war? Is it win-win? Is it win-lose? It's lose-lose. It's lose-lose big time. And you could argue the weapons industry is the only winner in a war, and even there, uh, you know, we can discuss what winning means in that context. But clearly, for almost everybody, war is lose-lose. Now, sometimes you still have to go to war, maybe to defend yourself. But generally, you're going to lose something. You're going to lose a lot. Maybe you gain more by preserving your liberty or everything. But materially, it's a massive loss. And again, just look at these Ukrainian cities. Look at the number of lives lost. We'll do questions at the end, if you don't mind. Just remember what you wanted to ask. I promise I'll answer. Massive destruction throughout. And the only reason there's not massive destruction right now in Russia is because the Russians have nukes and nobody wants to attack Russia proper. But the destruction is total. And think about, there's probably in excess of 200,000 young men who died on the, just the Russian side. Probably over 100, well not died, died and, uh, and injured, right? But injured so that they can't fight anymore. Serious injuries. 200,000. And that doesn't include the Ukrainians where it's over 100,000 on their side probably. We don't have exact, we don't have accurate numbers. But you know, by the time this conflict is over, I wouldn't be surprised if a million young men are either maimed or dead because of this. That's lose-lose. 
And no matter what benefits you might gain, that's lose-lose. And it takes a certain mentality and attitude towards economics that is oriented towards zero-sum thinking that gets you into lose-lose transactions. Because if you're engaged in life to win and really understand that in order to win, how do, we, how do you win in the game of life? You win in the game of life, among other things, by creating as many win-win relationships as you can, materially and spiritually. You become a billionaire by creating millions, hundreds of millions win-win relationships with your customers. You become just somebody who has friends and, 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 and enjoys social life by creating win-win relationships with people. And people engaged in that kind of activity, motivated by that kind, are not interested in war. They're interested in creating more win-win relationships. They don't want lose-lose. Lose-lose is like horrible. But think about the Russian economy. I mean, the economy of Russia is based on not quite a zero-sum view of the world, but close to a zero-sum view of the world. The Russian economy is not an economy that thrives on entrepreneurship and innovation and, uh, and, and, and small business and business creation. Under Putin, in particular, the Russian economy is being oriented towards one thing and really one thing only. What is that? Natural resources of one kind or another, primarily oil and gas. Everything else has been suppressed. Everything else has been rejected. Even though Russia has great engineers and great software people, and that hasn't been what you think of when you think of Russia qua economy. The entire state has oriented that economy towards oil, gas, and certain minerals, maybe agriculture. But it's all about taking stuff out of the ground and shipping it somewhere else. Which is not zero-sum, we know it's not zero-sum, but it's as close to you get to zero-sum thinking. There's no reason Russia had to have this kind of economy. The reason is the state decided on it. And one has to think about what is it about Putin that oriented him towards just wanting stuff out of the ground. Lack of respect for the human mind, lack of respect of entrepreneurs, maybe he didn't want too many independent thinkers, independent doers, independent wealthy people. All the billionaires in Russia are who? Oligarchs. His buddies. Yeah, we call them oligarchs, but at the end of the day, it's just another name for Putin's buddies. Right? And he can control them. Yeah, he's not going to control a bunch of Elon Musks. So the easiest thing is to create an economy where you don't get Elon Musks. And where there is an Elon Musk, they leave. Because you don't want them. You want a bunch of oligarchs who'll do what you tell them to do, who understand, at the end of the day, who holds the power in that circumstance. So, in my view, you know, war comes about when we have zero-sum thinking, when we have a collectivistic mindset, and we reject reason as our tool of knowing, uh, knowing the world. And I think that's what happened at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, as uh, philosophers constantly chipped away at the idea of reason as efficacious, as reason as valuable. You know, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Marx, uh, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche. Just, hey, reason doesn't matter. Reason is not efficacious. Reason doesn't teach us about the world out there. We create reality in our minds. All the variations of secularized mysticism, which is what I consider it. I mean, what is Marx if not a secularized mystical philosophy? You replace God with the proletarian, and it's just all the same. You as an individual don't matter. You have to sacrifice to, not God, you have to sacrifice to the proletarian. But you don't matter. Your mind doesn't matter. How do we discover truth? Well, you have to be born a proletarian to know the truth. Our bourgeoisie can't discover truth because there is no universal standard of reason. And if ever there was a philosophy that was zero sum, Marxism is zero sum. So with the rise of Marxism, with the rise of other 
zero-sum, anti-reason, anti-individualism ideas in Europe, it's no surprise we got a World War I. A World War I in the name of what? Nobody really knows, right, what the war was fought for, but it was basically a war of collectives fighting each other for power with the idea that power is to be gained not through win-win relationship, but through control, through war, through controlling other people. And World War II, again, mystical ideologies associated with race instead of class, but the same thing. The individual doesn't matter. Reason doesn't matter. How do we know what the truth is? Well, you have to be an Aryan to know what the truth is. Us Jews don't know the truth. We can't. We're just different type of human beings. Inferior. There's no difference. It's just a different way to categorize people, but it's always about categorizing people and, and the, your genes are what determine who and what you are. But it's about the individual. It doesn't matter. The collective matters. Reason doesn't matter. Revelation matters. And it's a zero-sum mentality. I need more land, Hitler told the, We need more land, Hitler told the Germans. Not more trade, not more entrepreneurs, not more innovation. We need more land. We need more oil. We need more gas. We need more natural resources. It's all the same thing. It's all the same mentality. And we got a World War II as a consequence. And for 80 years, to some extent, that mentality has been held back, partially by the fact that the Soviet Union clearly was a failure and partially by the fact that fascism clearly was a failure. And Europe, at least, was not going back to religion. So there was this void, a void that was filled mainly by people living their lives based on their own reason, caring about themselves, i.e. individualists. And because, I think, of economists' understanding of win-win relationship, the establishment of win-win relationships on a global scale. I mean, I think the European Union is a massive achievement in the sense of its original intent, free trade, money, capital, goods. That's fantastic. And that's a recognition of the non-zero-sum nature of the world. And you saw that, you know, all over, all over the West, trade opened up everywhere globally. There's a recognition of the value of the individual. You can go to any village anywhere in the world pretty much, not everywhere, but most places in the world, and you ask the audience, whose life, your life, who does it belong to? And I have a feeling that two, three hundred years ago, most people would say, the church, the king, the state. Nobody says that today. There's an implicit sense of individualism. Maybe it doesn't manifest it itself politically as we would like. There's a lot of work to do there. But in, there's a real implicit sense of individualism. There's an implicit sense of my mind is capable. I'm not looking for the philosopher king. There's a real implicit notion of that these ideas are true. But it's implicit. And for a long time, you can survive on these implicit ideas. Our philosophers, the people who teach here at the university and teach at universities in the United States and all over the world, don't believe in any of that. They don't believe the individual matters. They don't believe in human reason. And they have a really hard time with win-win relationships as with regard to trade. Almost all of them are statists when it comes to economics. So we have this populace that's kind of with us on the ideas that lead to peace, an intellectual class that has no clue, that is exactly opposed to it. And the result is, yes, we have peace, but it's weak. We are weak as countries. We don't know what we stand for. We don't know what identity is. We don't know what the West is. We talk about the West and civilization, but we have no clue what it is. We let it be challenged from the left and from the right and from the middle, and we have no way to defend it. One of the great challenges of liberalism today is to defend it. It's being attacked from every direction because our intellectuals are not liberals, not in the sense that we mean liberal. And I think Putin is a manifestation of those dark forces, those ancient dark forces, that lead us to war. And he could be an ominous sign of what is to come. Putin is a mystic. Listen to his talks. He is filled with this longing for some 
glorious, mystical, ancient Russian empire, Russian people, Russian land. I mean, there's, there's a, clearly a mystical notion to almost everything that he says and how he inspires his audience. So this is not uniquely to Putin. This is, cult, this is cultural in Russia. There's a Russian spirit, a Russian destiny, a Russian exceptionalism that's built into being Russian. We can argue about American exceptionalism, but American exceptionalism almost always is about ideas. Russian exceptionalism is almost always about genes, about heritage, about being part of this Russian-speaking world. They don't talk about ethnicity because Russia, of course, is multi-ethnic, but they talk about the spirit of the Russian language and the spirit of being Russian. And it's a dominant force in Russia. The individual doesn't matter for Putin or for Russia. What matters for the individual and for Russia is Russia. Sacrifice hundreds of thousands of young men on the, you know, on the ground. Nobody cares. I mean, their mothers care, their fathers care. Putin, people in charge, don't care. It's for greater cause, Mother Russia. And you can see how he's built his economy. It's an authoritarian economy, which you'd expect from an economy, from a regime that does not respect individualism and does not respect human individual reason. And he is committed to this zero sum. Let me say that while you, and this is, and this is why he went to war. You could, people could say that he went to war because he felt threatened by NATO. That's a joke. NATO's the last threatening thing in the world. There's nothing threatening about NATO. It's not threatening. It hasn't gone to war. It's not going to go to war. They can, NATO members barely agree on anything. There's no consensus. I mean, it's unique now that there is one because of this war. But before that, I mean, one of the reasons Putin went to war is because he believed NATO was fragmented and they'd never agree on anything. They would never threat him. And indeed, if that was the standard, if the standard was NATO expansion, well, Putin's lost the war already. Because much more valuable than Ukraine to NATO, much more valuable than Ukraine, is Finland and Sweden. They have much longer border with Russia. They have much better soldiers than Ukraine. I'm sorry, they have much longer border than Ukraine has with Russia. Finland and Sweden do in the north. They have much better arm, uh, 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 armies. And they actually manufacture their own weapons. They have very sophisticated weapon systems built in Sweden and Finland. The fact that they were not part of NATO was a relief to Putin. Now they are. He's lost this war. If that was the goal, the goal is to keep NATO away. NATO's just got much closer to Moscow, even closer to St. Petersburg, and really close to, I forget the name of the port in the, uh, in the Baltic Sea there, that, it, that, right, that is this far from Estonia and not that far from Finland and Sweden. So if NATO was the issue... I think the issue was his desire for empire, for the Russian people, for a legacy. He wants to have statues built, you know, constructed for him. He wants to be considered not Putin, but Putin the Great. There is a real desire here for a great Russian mystical state. He sees the West weakness. The West is weak. He sees they're not weak militarily, weak intellectually, weak philosophically, weak in our commitment to our ideas. He sees that weakness. He's exploiting it. He's been prodding us for years, invading Georgia, just to test it out. What did the West do when he invaded Georgia? Bring the Turgents. Nothing, basically. Nothing. You know, they said, don't go to Tbilisi. And George Bush, I think, told him that, but clear, clearly nothing. He prodded them in 2014 with Crimea and Donbass. What did the West do? Nothing. So what did he figure the West would do this time? Nothing. And this time he was going to go to Kiev and it was going to be over in a week. For a variety of reasons, he was that delusional. So he believes in this greater destiny of Russia. The West is weak. That is a sign. This is the time to, he's probably sick as well, so this is a good time for him to implement this destiny and bring it to the reality. Ukraine was goal number one. 
Georgia was going to be number two. If, they're not going to, if we're not going to stand up to him in Ukraine, we certainly wouldn't stand up to him in Georgia. Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, why not? Right? There's oil, there's natural resources. He is oriented towards oil and natural resources. Guess what exists in the southeast of Ukraine? Oil and natural gas, huge reserves, largest in Europe, exist right there under the Ukrainian land, on the border with Russia, the land that he now is occupying. He has that mentality of zero-sum, natural resources. That's what he wants, not trade. And there's one other thing that I think really scared Putin. Putin knows deep down, he'll never admit it, and he can't maybe even admit it even to himself. But Putin knows way deep down that he is an illegitimate leader. He knows enough about the world and about that legitimacy at the end of the day comes from the governed, comes from the people. He has stolen election after election. He is not a legitimate leader of a country. And he fears his own people. He's afraid of them. And he needs to give them a cause to focus on, not to focus on their own poverty. Russia is very poor. I think GDP per capita is a third of Germany's, something like that, half to a third of Germany's. That's pretty poor, given natural resources, given what they have. He wants them to focus away of that, there have been demonstrations in Russia over the last 20 years, repeatedly, of people unhappy. War is a great tonic, a uniter, something to divert attention so the, to the, away from the flaws of the regime, of his own flaws. And Ukraine is a real threat. And the threat that Ukraine constitutes for Russia is the fact that it's corrupt, and horrible a government that Ukraine has, the Ukrainian people have been slowly moving west intellectually. The spirit of the Ukrainians, the culture of the Ukrainians is, has been over the last 10, 15 years moving to the west. The 2014 revolution was a revolution to establish what the people hoped would be western values. They didn't quite get it. But they're working in that direction. And that's a real threat. I visited uh, Russia. I've spoken in Russia, in Moscow, and St. Petersburg. And I've been to Kiev several times. And there's a palpable difference in the air between the two places. Russia is an oppressive place. It's a scary place. And it's a state place where if you say something not so good, particularly about Putin, people look at you like, Ooh, you should be careful what... Uh, you, not to walk next to people with umbrellas or, I don't know if you know that, you know, uh, or, or, or what you drink or what you eat. Kiev was a, had that sense of you could say anything you wanted. You could do anything you wanted. It's corrupt. There are problems, but it was moving in the right direction, and that posed a real threat to Putin. It's not that NATO was going to be a neighbor. It was the West was getting closer to Moscow, and that's scary to a dictator of an authoritarian regime. The real danger, I think, long term here is that we don't find and we don't discover the ideas that allowed us to live in peace. And that this not be the last conflict. I, I think Putin's going to lose this one. I think that will establish peace for a little while, at least in Europe. But our ideas, we hold our ideas so weakly. We don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe in the ideas that made the West as rich as it is and as peaceful as it is. And if it's not Russia, maybe it's China, maybe it's, maybe it's something inside Europe, maybe it's a change in America, who knows? But there are many, many enemies of liberty, of liberal governance, of peace in the world right now. And unless we stand up to them, I think beginning with Putin, but stand up with them inside our own countries, then we are indeed destined to lose that peace and ultimately to lose that prosperity that has made life in the West over the last, certainly since World War II, pretty amazing. 
in spite of all our complaints about our governments, in spite of all our complaints about the modern world, in spite of all our complaints about left, woke, whatever, and, and, and crazy right, life's pretty good. But that is not necessary. <laughs> that is not determined. That does not always have to be the case. You know, when, when, um, you know, when Franklin left the uh, Constitutional Convention in America, somebody asked him, what kind of government did you give us? And he said, you know, a republic if you can keep it. It's upon us to be vigilant in the cause of liberty. It's upon us to understand the causes of liberty and to fight for them. And those causes are intellectual, those causes are philosophical. And if we don't defend them, I think we risk everything that we, that, all the beauty that we have built in what we call Western civilization. Thank you.